1942. We have come into North Africa shoulder to shoulder with our American friends to gain a vantage ground from which to open a new front against Hitler and Hitlerism, to cleanse the shores of Africa from the stain of Nazi and fascist tyranny. A steel trap is being thrown around Hitler's Africa Corps. From Egypt, Montgomery's Eighth Army moves west. From Morocco, Eisenhower's forces move east. Russia is striking prodigious blows on the Eastern Front. The invincible defense of Stalingrad has already yielded results of the first magnitude. The jaws of another winter are closing on Hitler's armies. Says Winston Churchill, by singleness of purpose, by steadfastness of conduct, by tenacity and endurance, only by these can we discharge our duties. Says Hitler to the Germans in the desert, no withdrawal. To the trapped Germans in the snow at Stalingrad, he says, stand until the last man. Stalingrad, 1942. The lure of Stalingrad fascinated Hitler. Its very name was a challenge. It became a magnet to the German army and air force. Progress was made at the cost of terrible slaughter. In military opinion, it was high time to call a halt. 180 German divisions have the consolation of knowing that they are led not by the German general staff, but by Corporal Hitler himself. Nothing could overcome the Russians fighting with passionate devotion amid the ruins of their city. Since early December, a three-cornered correspondence has been going on among Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin on a meeting to discuss the conduct of the war in 1943. But the tense situation at Stalingrad keeps the Soviet leader at home. The president now sent me a genial letter. Dear Winston, I have not had an answer to my second invitation to our Uncle Joe, but on the assumption that he will again decline, I think that in despite of it, you and I should get together. I asked General Beadle Smith to check up on some possible tourist oasis. One of the dictionaries says, an oasis is never wholly dry. Good old dictionary. The date agreed upon for the meeting is January 14. The place, Casablanca. The president and I now had a number of agreeable interchanges on questions of security. He proposed to call himself Admiral Q. I wrote to the president, however did you think of such an impenetrable disguise? In order to make it even harder for the enemy and to discourage irreverent guesswork, I proposed Admiral Q and Mr. P. Take notice, we must mind our P's and Q's. At the Casablanca conference, French generals Giraud and de Gaulle shake hands. The first step on the unification of the Free French forces is taken. The combined chiefs of staff reach a complete understanding on military strategy for the North African campaign and the conduct of the war in 1943, with its ultimate aim, the total defeat of Germany. At a momentous press conference, Roosevelt and Churchill tell the world of the decisions taken at Casablanca. Negotiation with Hitler was impossible. He was a maniac with supreme power to play out his hand to the end, which he did, and so did we. We, the United Nations, demand from the Nazi, fascist, and Japanese tyrannies unconditional surrender. We plan a world in which all the branches of the human family 
may look forward toward what the American Declaration of Independence calls life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Personally, I was very satisfied with the way this had gone. Touched by Churchill's thoughtfulness is Eisenhower's driver, Miss Kay Summersby. I remember I had several occasions to meet the Prime Minister, but I remember one that stood out very, rather vividly in my mind. This was in North Africa. It was after the Casablanca Conference, and I was driving Mr. Churchill and General Eisenhower, and we had quite a little trip. And then the Prime Minister got out of the car, and he said, I'm glad to see that driving on the opposite side of the road in North Africa doesn't seem to bother you. And then he suddenly came back to me alone, and he said, I'm very sorry to hear that your fiancé has been killed in action. And I thought, really, what a very great man he was with all the problems on his mind at that time, to have time to be able to say a kind word to me. The conference comes to an end on January 24. The president prepared to depart. But I said to him, you cannot go all this way to North Africa without seeing Marrakesh. Let us spend two days there. I must be with you when you see the sunset on the snows of the Atlas Mountains. Roosevelt and I drove together the 150 miles across the desert and reached the famous oasis. Marrakesh was the Paris of the Sahara. Fortune tellers, snake charmers, masses of food and drink. And on the whole, the largest and most elaborately organized brothels in the African continent. While Churchill is at Marrakesh, the 8th Army makes good progress in its advance across Libya. January 23, Tripoli is taken. Winston Churchill flies to the newly captured city of Tripoli to visit Montgomery and his desert army, which has advanced 1,000 miles from Alamein. witnessed the magnificent entry of the 8th Army through its stately streets. At their head were the pipers of the 51st Highland Division. Spick and span they looked after all their marching and fighting. In Tripoli, Churchill addresses 2,000 officers and men of Montgomery's headquarters. Soldiers and airmen. After the war, when a man is asked what he did, it will be quite sufficient for him to say, I marched and fought with the Desert Army. And when history is written, your feet will gleam and glow and will be a source of song and story long after we who are gathered here have passed away. Later, the 8th Army crosses the frontier into Tunisia.
the formidable Marath Line, 20 miles of carefully constructed defense positions, now stands between the Army and the Africa Corps. The Germans were prepared and the problem of breaking through in a frontal attack was formidable. Surrender is forbidden, Hitler said. You must continue to the last man and the last round. While the Africa Corps in the desert awaits the attack of the British 8th Army, the German armies are trapped in the snows of Stalingrad. There was no hope for von Paulus. Great efforts were made to supply him from the air. But little got through. The cold was intense. Food and ammunition were scarce, and an outbreak of typhus added to the miseries of the Germans. We have no winter clothes, a German soldier writes. We have been swindled and have been condemned to death. We shall die of the war or of frost. The Russians send an ultimatum to von Paulus. The situation of your troops is desperate. Should you refuse our offer, that you laid down your arms, we will be compelled to proceed with the destruction of the encircled German troops. Second of February, 1943, the Russian general Rokossovsky cables Stalin. The troops of the Don Front completed the destruction of the encircled forces at Stalingrad. As a result of this final liquidation, the military operations in the city and area of Stalingrad have ceased. disaster to the Germans ended Hitler's prodigious effort to conquer Russia by force of arms. at Stalingrad are staggering. 200,000 killed, 90,000 taken prisoner. But no horses. These have all been eaten. Churchill sends this message to Stalin. Pray accept my congratulations on the surrender of Field Marshal von Paulus and the end of the Sixth Army. This is indeed a wonderful achievement. It is the Russian army that tore the guts out of the German military machine. And in London, after his extensive travels, 
Churchill carries on a personal fight of his own. In the evening of February the 16th, my temperature suddenly rose and Lord Moran, my personal physician who had been watching me, said I had pneumonia. Churchill is put to bed and all but the most important war papers are kept from him. But there are a few diversions. A gentleman kindly presented me with a lion. He was a male lion of fine quality and in eight years became the father of many children. One morning, my assistant secretary, physically on the small side, came with some papers. Indulging chaff, I showed him a magnificent photograph of the lion with his mouth open. And I said, if there are any shortcomings in your work, sir, I shall send you to him. Meat is very short now. Africa, we have struck the enemy a blow which is the equal of Stalingrad. For this, we have to thank the military intuition of Corporal Hitler. We may notice the touch of the master's hand. It is the same insensate obstinacy which condemned von Paulus and his army to destruction at Stalingrad. Montgomery, like a foxhound on the scent, stays on Rommel's heels. Every mile that Rommel retreats brings him a mile closer to the advancing Allied forces under Eisenhower. Caught between the two forces, Rommel makes a final desperate attempt to break out. He is forced to withdraw into the jaws of Montgomery's 8th Army. Montgomery reports that Rommel attacked at dawn. It is very foolish of him. It's an absolute gift. I have 500 anti-tank guns dug into the ground. The man must be mad. Every attack was beaten off with heavy loss. The 9th Corps pressed on and entered Tunis and then swerved north towards the United States forces. The two armies, which had started nearly 2,000 miles apart, were now at last joined together. on May 13, General Alexander cables Churchill. Sir, it is my duty to report that all enemy resistance has ceased. We are masters of the North African shores. No one could doubt the magnitude of the victory of Tunis. It held its own with Stalingrad. Nearly a quarter of a million prisoners were taken. Africa was clear of our foes. One continent had been redeemed. In London there was, for the first time in the war, a real lifting of spirits. The King writes to Winston Churchill. Now that the campaign in Africa has reached a glorious conclusion, I wish to tell you how profoundly I appreciate the fact that its initial conception and successful prosecution are largely due to your vision and to your unflinching determination in the face of early difficulties. The African campaign has immeasurably increased the debt that this country and indeed all the United Nations owe to you.